the right. After listening to what James White had to say about annihilationism, I feel ever more confident that annihilationism is the correct interpretation of all that the Bible has to say about hell. The right. So James White was asked a question about Isaiah 34 and its connection to Revelation 14, which we've talked about on this channel. So we're going to listen to his response and I'll react to it as we go along. So before we get into Dr. White's response, let me read the two scriptures that we're going to be talking about. Isaiah 34, 10 says, It, Edom, meaning the kingdom of Edom, it says their streets will be turned into pitch, and it shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. And Revelation 14, 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day or night, those who worship the beast and his image. So in Dr. White's program, uh, somebody called in and asked a question about that verse. And if Isaiah 34 is saying Edom, which is an earthly kingdom, which was destroyed and is not still on fire, yet the Bible says its smoke shall ascend forever. If uh, Isaiah is using that eternal imagery to describe a temporal destruction of an earthly kingdom, then when Revelation 14 uses the exact same terminology, why do we assume it means eternal torment in hell? Why doesn't it also mean temporal destruction using eternal language? You know how in Isaiah 34 verse 10 it says that the smoke will rise forever from generation to generation. This is talking about like the judgment of the people of Edom mm -hmm. and they ask me how is it that that imagery can't apply to the new testament when the new right. testament authors are writing about hell yep they're right did you just hear that did you just hear what he said let me play it again they're right conditionalism is one of the hardest things to deal with from a biblical perspective it's it's the arguments are tough okay let me just quickly point out some terminology that he's using here he just said the word conditionalism uh the words annihilationism conditionalism and conditional immortality all mean the same thing so i will very often say annihilationism dr white will say conditionalism they mean the same thing oh by the way you you need to be aware the vast majority of new testament scholars hold that view um i can name numerous conditionalists who are uh, new testament scholars um it just it's almost the default pr perspective all right no i didn't know that this is dr white statistics he said the vast majority of new testament scholars hold to that view of conditionalism or annihilationism that is very comforting for me to know because i believe in eternal torment for 30 years as a christian and 19 years before that and it's only recently i have renounced that belief in eternal torment and embrace annihilationism and it wasn't just because i feel like i wanted to be right i've studied the scriptures on it and it's comforting for people like me to know that that these bible scholars who devote their life to studying the bible and pioneering theology they tend to gravitate towards that view as well you know we're not talking about the, the masses of christians who are just blind followers we're not talking about pastors who don't even know what they're saying half the times they open their mouth. We're talking about New Testament Bible scholars, right? And the fact that they all, well, not all, but the, the vast majority, according to Dr. White, tend to gravitate towards conditionalism or annihilationism, that is very comforting for me to know. I'm in very good company. There's almost a, a, a connection between it and a belief in penal substitutionary atonement. A lot of people don't accept that either. And there's almost a connection there that if you do accept penal substitutionary atonement, then it's probably going to impact your views and those things too. Penal substitutionary atonement is the theology that says when Jesus died on the cross, he was punished as our substitute. So he took our place and took our punishment on himself on that cross. And that's what this cross of Christ means. It was not a good man dying for what he believed. 
He was not merely setting an example of self-sacrifice. He was dying in our place. A penal substitutionary atonement seems to be what the Bible teaches, and I, I don't see how you could read it any other way. Uh, that's the belief that I hold. That's the belief that Dr. White holds. And he says there is a connection between that belief and annihilationism. Now, what exactly is that connection? Well, if you believe that Jesus took our place on the cross, meaning he bore the punishment for our sins, then how much time did Jesus spend being tormented in hell? Zero. The punishment for our sins was death. He died on the cross. That's the connection between uh, penal substitutionary atonement and annihilationism. 99% of the ministers that I minister with regularly have never seriously engaged the arguments of the annihilationists or they're also called the conditionalists. The vast majority of people believe what they believe in the subject by tradition and have never been challenged to seriously think through what this position is all about. I could not have said it better myself. There's really nothing to add to that. So with all that he said so far, why isn't Dr. White an annihilationist? Well, now he gives three reasons why he thinks annihilationism is wrong, and we're going to go through those three reasons. But here's the issue. It's not, can you come up with a way of interpreting eternal punishment, eternal life, parallel, Matthew 25. Um, is there a difference between the imagery of Isaiah and Revelation in regards to the punishment of the beast and uh, the punishment of Edom or anything like that? Are there not greater fulfillments in in, in in the revelation aspect than you would have in something like that. For me, the issue is soteriology and anthropology. All right, that's quite a mouthful there, so let's break it up. He is in the middle of saying that it is not really about the difference in imagery between Isaiah and Revelation. It's not about Matthew 25. It's not about the interpretation of what he would what he calls proof text. It is more about two theological concepts which we will talk about in just a little while. Now, before we actually get into his reason, I, I want to point out something. He is saying it's not about the interpretations of proof texts to see, but more about theological concepts. I think the fact that he's taking that approach says a lot because he knows that if he goes into the actual scriptures, there's only one conclusion, just like the vast majority of New Testament Bible scholars would find, it leads to annihilationism. So therefore, to combat annihilationism, he does not want to debate on the level of interpretations of scriptures. He wants to debate it on the level of theology. And I think that says a lot. But in the middle of what he just said, he kind of said something in passing. He said, there is a greater fulfillment in Revelation than you would find in the book of Isaiah. So he didn't really commit himself to that argument, but he kind of just threw it out there. You know, he just kind of threw it out there like, okay, if, if it turns out to be right, then I said it. If it turns out to be wrong, then don't quote me on it. All right, so let's look at that. What does he mean? by the greater fulfillment. He means that Isaiah 34 uses the language, its smoke shall ascend forever. And when Isaiah said it, it was referring to the temporal destruction of an earthly kingdom. So Isaiah probably used it as a metaphor. But when Revelation used it, referring to the punishment of people who took the mark of the beast, the smoke of their torment ascends forever. Revelation means literally to eternal torment forever and ever, right? So he's saying that uh, there's a greater fulfillment in the book of Revelation than you would find in the Old Testament prophecy. Now, the problem with that is that you're going to have to then impose that idea on the text. The book of Revelation uses a lot of language and imagery from Old Testament prophecy. For example, it talks about uh, seven candlesticks, two olive trees, and stuff like that. So to say that it means something radically different, even the opposite of what the Old Testament meant when it used the same imagery and language, is kind of imposing an idea on the text. So that is the main weakness of 
of the approach he's taking but there's another way to look at this whole intensification thing uh, you could say well in isaiah 34 it talked about the temporal destruction of edom but then he looked forward into the future of future edom which will be in hell being eternally tormented in fire so you could make that argument and yeah, there are some Old Testament passages that do seem to use that kind of already not yet dynamic. But let's test it now to see if Isaiah 34 actually says that. Uh, in Isaiah 34, the first nine verses clearly talk about the destruction of Edom. It says things like, there will be a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Its streams shall be turned into pitch, its dust into brimstone, its land shall become burning pitch talking about Edom in the time when Isaiah lived, so I'll just call that present-day Edom. But then, it switches to eternal language. It shall not be quenched night or day, and we know that literally it was quenched. Its smoke shall ascend forever and ever. We know the smoke stopped ascending once the fires went out. So they will say that that verse is not talking about the temporal destruction of Edom, which happened like 600 years ago, but it's talking about future day Edom, which will be in hell, burning forever and ever. But then the text goes on to say, from generation to generation it shall lie waste, no one will ever pass through it forever and ever, but the pelican and the porcupine shall possess it, the owl and the raven shall dwell in it. So it seems to have gone back to Edom in present day. Right, so it starts off with present day Edom, for half a verse it switches to future Edom in hell, then it switches back to present day Edom. That's the problem. You see, you don't see the consistency in using the future, present, already not yet dynamic. Now, there are scriptures that use that technique, but when, you, when it does, you will find that there is a nice clear division between the present and the future. Look at Isaiah 61. Jesus quoted this verse when he began his ministry. In Luke chapter 4, he said, The Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book. But the text in Isaiah goes on to say, And the day of the vengeance of our God, and they shall rebuild the ancient ruins and whatnot. Clearly, the rest of the text is not talking about Jesus' first coming, but his second coming. In Isaiah 61, we see a nice clear division between his first coming and his second coming. It doesn't go back and forth like we see in Isaiah 34. So the better way to, uh, to understand Isaiah 34 is not using the future Edom in hell technique, the already not yet, that he is talking about the so-called greater fulfillment in the book of Revelation. But the better way is to realize that Isaiah is using the language of eternal judgment to describe temporal destruction. And most likely when Revelation used the same language, it meant the same thing. He is describing the, the destruction of people in hell and he's using the language of eternal punishment and eternal torment. For me, the issue is soteriology and anthropology. Two big words, soteriology and anthropology. Anthropology means the nature of man. What is man? And specifically, is man an eternal being? Do we have an immortal soul? And I have other videos where I talk about that. that that's only God is immortal. Man is not an eternal being. And soteriology refers to the atonement of Christ, the doctrine of salvation. And what exactly is the connection between that and annihilationism? We'll, we'll see later on what uh, Dr. White means by that. When people object to the eternal punishment of the wicked. Their objection is that even though they may have been very wicked, they were only wicked for a certain period of time. For a limited period of time, that in our minds seems completely out of proportion to eternal destruction. Because the conditional will say, eternal destruction just simply means destruction that has eternal consequences. It's done, mm -hmm. you're gone, that's it and you've remained that way. The, the driving force is this idea that temporal sin cannot justly require eternal punishment. 
All right, just to clarify, that is not the biblical annihilationist position. Now, admittedly, there are some people who say finite sin deserves finite punishment. That is just amusing of the human mind because you could just as easily flip the switch and say, well, finite sins against an infinite God deserves infinite punishment. And again, neither of those two things constitute a biblical argument. That's just the musing of one human being versus the musing of another human being. They're both human logic. So if you were to construct a biblical annihilationist position, it is not that temporal sin deserves temporal punishment. That is not uh, what annihilationism teaches because the Bible clearly says eternal punishment, Matthew 25, 46. So there's no such thing as finite punishment. The question is what that punishment is. Annihilationism does not teach finite sin deserves finite punishment. It teaches sin deserves death. Because what, what have you heard as the normal response to that? The normal response to that is, yeah, but it's, it is an infinite character that has been violated. It's God's mm. infinite character that has been violated by our sin. And therefore that warrants eternal punishment. Okay, um, that's not specifically stated in Scripture that way, but I, I think it's a it's a valid point to make. But is that really the best answer? <clears throat> and here's what I would suggest to you: Why is it that we assume that every person who dies as a rebel against God is changed into a saint when they die, including the wicked? Because the assumption we all make is that when we die, we stop sinning. Now, the only way you can stop sinning is if you are sanctified. The reality is, those who die in rebellion against Christ not only continue in that state upon their death and upon their discovery that they are now separated from God and under his wrath, but now the restraint that was placed upon them in this life is removed from them. This is the key issue, because if you're going to argue, well, it's not proper to eternally punish someone, but what if they remain in a, in a condition of rebellion? All right, so let's summarize what he just said. He's trying to characterize the annihilationist position, and he's saying, if we say finite sin deserves finite punishment, which is not the annihilationist position, but, but if that's the argument, then he made a very good comeback. He says, okay, let's suppose you commit X amount of sin on earth and God determines the punishment for that is five years torment in hell. But then during those five years, you continue to murmur against God and curse God and sin. Then he has to add five more years and then you continue to sin. So he will add five more years and he will add again and again. And eventually it will turn into eternity. Right? That, will, that is a good argument if the annihilationist position was finite sin deserves finite punishment. But I already told you, that is not a biblical position. The biblical position is that finite sin deserves death. Sin deserves death. Right, And there's a whole volume of scripture that I could quote to support me on that. Romans 6.23 specifically says the wages of sin is death. Right, It never said the wages of sin is death torment and fire, whether it be infinite torment and fire or even finite torment and fire. The wages of sin is death. So the only thing I could clearly tell you from the Bible is that the punishment for sinners is death. Will sinners be tormented for a period of time commensurate with their sins before they die? I can't even tell you the Bible teaches that. Our human mind would like to believe that. I would like to believe that Hitler will be tormented for a very long time and Bin Laden and those Hamas guys who committed the atrocities of, of October 7th. I would like to believe that, rapists, murderers. But I cannot tell you that the Bible teaches that. I could only tell you that the Bible teaches the wages of sin is death. How much torment, if any, sinners will, will experience in hell before they are destroyed? The Bible doesn't give me anything by which I could derive a mathematical formula. I simply do not know the answer to that question. Uh, here's something else to consider. When Jesus died on that cross, there are 
about 117 billion people who ever lived in human existence, he paid the penalty for all their sins and yet he was not tormented in hell for one second. How much torment will sinners experience in hell that God determines is an appropriate punishment for their sins on earth? I'm sorry, I, I simply do not know the answer to that question. All I could say is that, that the Bible teaches the wages of sin is death. So Dr. White is doing a very good job of refuting a position that annihilationism doesn't really teach. So, yeah. Yeah. so the question, so the only question is, does the light of the cross and the empty tomb tell us that God can suspend at some point the punishment of that continuing rebellion and just simply take that person out of existence? Does the light of the cross on the empty tomb tell us that God could suspend the punishment of continuing rebellion? And he's talking about people in hell, right? He, he's continuing on his point where people are in hell, being tormented, and they're continuing to sin against God. They're continuing to rebel and murmur and curse God. Does the resurrection of Christ, does the atonement of Christ give God a basis for ending the torment of these people and annihilating them? That's uh, the question that he is asking. And I believe he's asking the wrong question because, like I said, the punishment for sin is not torment in fire. The punishment for sin is death. He is assuming that the punishment for sin is torment in fire, whether infinite or finite. So the atonement of Christ has nothing to do with uh, the nature of the torment that people experience in hell. And God doesn't need the atonement of Christ to decide, all right, I'm going to apply the atonement of Christ to these people in hell and I'm going to end their suffering. No, the atonement of Christ only benefits Christians. We who believe, we who believe are saved from wrath. Right? The atonement of Christ saves us from wrath, but it doesn't specify what that wrath is. Whatever that wrath is, whether that wrath is annihilationism, death, whether that wrath is some torment in fire plus death, or whether that wrath is eternal torment in fire, whatever that wrath is, that's what the atonement of Christ saves us from. And, that, and, the, and the unbelievers who go to hell will not benefit at all from the atonement of Christ. So what Whatever the, their punishment is, it is. All right? The atonement of Christ will never absolve them from that punishment. The question is, what is the wrath of God? What is the punishment for sin? And I could easily argue from Scripture that the punishment for sin is death. If God decides to give the sinner in hell, like Hitler and Bin Laden, some amount of torment in, in fire before he annihilates them, that information resides solely in the counsel of God. God has given me nothing in scripture from which to derive a mathematical formula. I respect, yeah. I respect the conditionalists. Their arguments are far better than our side is willing to admit because we don't listen to them. I wish a lot of people could hear that. All right, there are people who I know will unsubscribe from my channel. They will call me a false teacher. Look at what Dr. White just said. He respects the conditionalists. And their arguments are much better than they're willing to give credit for. It's not a fringe group of, of mouth breeders who live in a basement, who babysit each other's kids in a commune. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the majority of New Testament Bible scholars. I wish... Uh, people from the Reformed Baptist and Reformed Calvinist community could hear what he just said. And I've said, yeah. I, I wish they were right. I'm convinced they're not, but I wish they were right because it would simplify a lot of stuff. But what I would like things to be and the way things are, are two different things. All right, so what strikes me is the way James White tunes down his normal level of rhetoric. This is not how James White normally is. Right? This guy is a champion debater in the Reformed Calvinist Church or Reformed Baptist Church. I'm not sure which one. He does not back down from a debate. Just to put things in perspective, this guy, James White, went to Pakistan to debate on the deity of Christ. I want you to listen to what I just said. Pakistan, that's the country where Osama bin Laden found refuge. Right? He went there to argue that Jesus Christ is God. Do you have any idea how crazy that is? I think it would be an understatement to say that Dr. White 
likes to the beat. And the way he toned it down so many notches when talking about annihilationism, it says a lot. Here's what I heard. I, James White, have listened to you annihilationists. I have heard your arguments, unlike other people in my community who will not even listen to you. I have listened to you. I have listened to your arguments and they are rock solid. I sincerely hope you are right. I think you are wrong, but I have no interest in debating you. But since you asked me a question, here is my answer for what it's worth. That's how it came across to me. And listening to the way James White toned down his rhetoric when dealing with annihilationism gives me a lot of confidence in my position. I have spent 49 years believing in eternal torment and I only recently changed that belief to annihilationism. And I'll tell you this, after watching James White's video, that decision is looking really good right about now. Check out the other uh, videos in my series if you haven't seen them. Uh, like the video if this has been a blessing to you and check out for my new videos every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Search for my name or the channel name on YouTube and that will take you straight to my channel. Thank you for watching. God bless you and I will see you all next time.